So I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Michael Mamp, who teaches in fashion merchandising and design at Central Michigan University. His primary research focuses on 20th century dress and apparel industry history, and he completed his PhD in dress history at Iowa State University on the subjects of his paper today. Michael's a textile designer and also a member of the board of directors at the Midwest region of the Costume Society of America. And uh, Michael is another person that we've been really fortunate to get to know and to get to know about his research during our research. And he's going to introduce us to two more fascinating women. So please help me welcome him. Hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. And thank you so much, Hazel, for that introduction. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about Bonwit Teller and specifically two women who were presidents of Bonwit Teller one in the 1930s and another during the 1960s, Hortense Odlum and Mildred Custon. But before I get to that, this is a retail maven you have likely never heard of before. At the young age of 18, she accepted a job behind the first Estee Lauder counter in the state of Michigan, and over the next 30 years would work her way from sales girl to senior women's dress buyer at Crowley's in Detroit. If you haven't guessed yet, she was my mother. Lorraine Barbara Mamp. As I was deciding on a research focus for my dissertation, I had hit a temporary brick wall on a different topic. I don't know if this is how Shirley MacLaine would go about getting out on a limb, but I drank a bottle of wine and went to bed. <laughs> that night I dreamed of a final shopping trip my mother and I had made together in November of 87. She would pass away the following June. You see, our favorite pastime was shopping. And she always worked up until the last few months of her life. So she wasn't about to miss this opportunity to be there bright and early on a Black Friday, so we spent ours at Bonwit Teller at Somerset Collection just north of Detroit in Troy, Michigan. I awoke suddenly and it occurred to me. I'm not sure if Lorraine was speaking to me or not, but Bonwit Teller was indeed meant to be the avenue of my query. From the 19th century onward, a myriad of new retail stores developed within the United States. These establishments provided shoppers, particularly women, assortments of fashion products that helped shape the American culture of consumption. Ready to wear flooded the marketplace and prompted the democratization of fashion. Authors have explored the role that women played as consumers and entry-level saleswomen in stores in both America and abroad. However, less is documented regarding female management and leadership contributions in retail. Stories of legendary men such as Marshall Field, Harry Selfridge, John Wanamaker, and James Cash Penny abound. Conversely, aside from scholarship regarding Dorothy Shaver and her career at Lord & Taylor, documentation of female contributions in retail is limited. Furthermore, although Bonwit Teller operated for close to 100 years, 1895 to 1990, the history of the store remains somewhat obscure. The New York-based Bonwit Teller was founded by Paul Bonwit as a women's specialty store in 1895. In the early part of the 20th century, Bonwitz was known as a retailer that provided luxury goods to a discerning clientele. Mr. Bonwit, pictured on the right here, was a merchant who demanded the finest of fashions for his customers, and his passion for style and quality established his namesake business as a premier choice for New York's elite. A promotional catalog produced by the store in 1928 stated, quote, it was Mr. Bonwit's ambition to create the first great store devoted exclusively to the finest apparel and accessories for women and misses, end quote. Bonwit executed his store with the focus of a specialty boutique, yet on the scale of a department store. The store occupied several different locations until 1930, when the permanent flagship was established at 56 and 5th Avenue, an address in New York retailing that remained synonymous with luxury. However, once at the new location, the exclusivity that Bonwitz was known for vanished in a cavernous space previously occupied by A.T. Stewart and Company, department store, a larger and more diversified business. Moving exhausted financial reserves, and Mr. Bonwit was unable to sufficiently update the store interior or even fill it with enough products. At the same time, sales had softened as a result of the Great Depression. Bonwit defaulted on his loans, and Atlas Corporation, owned and operated by Floyd Odlum, acquired the company in 1931. Odlum, a lawyer and venture capitalist by trade, was unsure of what to do with a women's store. However, he had noticed that the company in the years leading up to 1930, 
1930 had generated about $500,000 a year in profits. This previous financial success intrigued Doblem, and so he decided to ask his wife, Hortense, for advice as to what was wrong with the store. Hortense Odlum was born in 1892. She was the third of six children to Hector and Ella McQuarrie. She's from the small town of St. George, Utah, where her father was an elder in the Mormon church and a farmer. Her paternal ancestors converted to the Mormon faith while still in their native Scotland and immigrated to Utah in 1855. Hortense, who referred to herself as the, quote, homely sister of three beauties, end quote, was a precocious child who delighted in staging elaborate puppet plays for neighborhood children and spent solitary hours in the attic dreaming of her future. Her proclivity for shopkeeping was evidenced at an early age as she would make corn husk dolls that she then sold to neighborhood children in a makeshift store she had set up in her backyard in exchange for pins, matches, or eggs. In 1915, Hortense met a lawyer from Colorado named Floyd. They were married that same year, and the first of two children, Stanley and Bruce, was born in 1916. Their first year of marriage was one of scrimping and saving to support their new family on Floyd's salary of $50 a month. Hortense said of this period, quote, my budget ignored such needs as clothes and amusements. We were clothed insofar as the demands of decency required. It didn't matter that we couldn't afford a daily paper, end quote. Floyd Odlum's company gave him a raise to $75 a month and then asked him to relocate to their New York office. With two suitcases holding all their worldly possessions and new baby Bruce in tow, the Odlums moved to New York via train where their lives changed rapidly. Floyd ascended the corporate ladder to the position of vice president and then started his own company in 1923 with $40,000 the couple had saved up. By 1930, that had grown into a value of over $120 million. His company, Atlas Corporation, sold holdings prior to the stock market crash of 1929 and was then able to use that liquidity to acquire several new companies for a fraction of their value before the crash. In 14 years, Floyd Odlum had become one of the 10 most wealthiest men in America. So in that um, group of things that he picked up prior to the crash, one of them ended up being Bonwit Teller. And as I mentioned, Floyd had asked Hortense what her opinion was on the store and asked her to go in first on a consulting basis. She approached her association with the store from the only perspective she really knew, that of a customer who appreciated quality, style, service, and friendliness. Keep in mind that prior to this, and Hortense, who was now the age 40, had never worked, had only been um, a wife and a mother and worked primarily within the home, and had very little education. She created an environment that catered to a modern woman offering products that would be appreciated, truly a woman's place. Odlum had been everything from extremely poor to unbelievably wealthy. These experiences informed her approach to making a store that was in her own words, quote, high class but not high hat, end quote. Meaning that style and elegance abounded, but every woman, irrespective of income or social class, would feel welcome. So one of the first things that um, Odlin did at Bonwit Teller during her time as a consultant was to relocate the millinery department to the first floor of the store. Mr. Bonwit was adamantly against it. Um, however, Odlin was undeterred and maintained that, quote, women know what women want in a store, end quote. She instinctively knew that a hat was an impulsive purchase and that women on a budget could better afford a new hat to create a different look versus an entirely new dress. Odlum's instinct was correct. The new department opened and millinery sales tripled. The example that's on the screen here is a Madame Agnes hat um, from the same year that Hortense made the millinery move to the first floor and is held in the collection at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. By 1934, uh, Floyd and Hortense had decided that if they were really going to make any significant changes at the store, that she needed to really be in charge. So Mr. Bonwit officially retired, and Hortense was put in place as president of the store in 1934. Odlum quickly repainted and cleaned up the store, but also went about cooling the store with air conditioning. In the 1930s, air conditioning was not yet widely available. The first air-conditioned car wasn't actually manufactured until 1939, and only the wealthy had the pleasure of affording private residence air conditioning. Most businesses did not employ the technology until the mid to late 1940s. 
The Great Depression initially stalled the widespread adoption of air conditioning, and World War II further delayed progress of the invention, first developed in 1902 to cool an overheating printing press. However, in May of 1938, more than 1,300 employees gathered to celebrate as Odlum, quote, cut a silver cord putting the motors into operation, end quote. The store capitalized on this event and announced the innovation in an advertisement on the fifth page of the New York Times, which featured a quote from Odlum. We have, an air con we have air conditioned every inch from entrance to eaves, and that means a cool, comfortable, healthful summer for employees as well as pleasant shopping for all our customer friends. A cool environment in May 1938 ensured good business for the summer, particularly as retail stores often experienced decreased sales in the hot months of July and August. As business increased under Odlum's tenure, more departments were added to the store, and additional space was required. In mid-1938, the construction began at the store that would add two additional floors at a cost of $85,000. This added 12,000 square feet of space that, according to Odlum, would be used to, quote, handle increasing business and to permit reallocation of a number of selling departments, as well as to provide additional space for service departments, end quote. These additional departments and services allowed Odlum to gain market share and attract customers to the store. In the throes of the Great Depression, and within three years of becoming president, business dramatically increased and the sales staff grew from 600 to over 1,400 people. Between 1935 and 1937, total sales volume at the store increased 62 percent and profits increased 305 percent. These financial achievements allowed Bonwitz to pay back a $300,000 bank loan in 1937, and additionally, the New York Times reported in 1939, quote, one of the largest realty deals consummated recently in the Fifth Avenue District, end quote, when Bonwit Teller acquired sole ownership of the building they occupied and purchased the space outright from the landlord. What you're looking at here is an image from the collection of the Museum of the City of New York that shows the expansion of the store where these two additional floors were being added to the building, along with the advertisement that announced the mercury goes down but spirits go up, telling customers about the addition of air conditioning to the store. Diversified pricing prompted Odlum's creation of new departments. It was her viewpoint that women of different economic means should all be able to feel good about how they looked. According to Odlum, quote, shopping is a very important thing to a woman, and she should be given help, expert help, in finding just the right thing for her, regardless of her income. Stores ought to take more of an interest in her problems, not just let her wander around until she buys something in desperation." End quote. Odlum focused starting in 1934 on the development of a new department at the store that provided access to the finest fashions of Paris and custom designs called the Salon de Couture. The newly designed space occupied the entire fourth floor of the building and was decorated by a celebrated female interior designer of the time, Agnes Rao Fairman, whose work for Bonwit Teller achieved an atmosphere that was described as a Parisian couturier salon. Odlum recognized, being a discerning woman of means herself, that Bonwitz was not offering exclusive enough products to New York's social elite. Competitors such as Saks Fifth Avenue, Salon Moderne, headed by Sophie Gimbel since 1931, were very successful, and Bonwitz wasn't effectively competing in this arena. Fira Benenson, who I think we've heard mentioned already today, and who actually went by the professional name of the Countess Elinska, she signed all of her co uh, correspondence with the singular Alinska. Her husband actually was a questionable Russian count. Uh, was hired to serve in capacity as director of the Salon de Couture and was there from 1934 until 1948. Benenson created made-to-order clothes and showed small, customizable collections each season of her own designs to Bonwick customers. Odlum was also thinking ahead. She wanted to be able to produce high-end, customized clothing as the threat of war loomed in Europe and would likely cut the store off from suppliers abroad. You see Fira Benenson pictured on the left-hand side of the screen in this portrait and then also at work in her atelier uh, fitting this gown to the dress form. 
Recently, out of the clear blue, there was a post to the FIT blog that was also talking about discovering Fira Benenson. And these illustrations that you see on the screen are actually illustrations of Benenson's work that were recently acquired by the archive at FIT. Adlam recalled, quote, I insisted that we have the facilities to create exquisite gowns which would always be remembered by their wearers. These are actually two examples of surviving material culture of Fira Benenson's work, both from the 30s that are in the collection of the Met. And in 1948, once Fira Benenson left Bonwit Teller, she would go on to create her own wholesale line for a time that was actually offered exclusively at Lord & Taylor. Not only was the Salon de Couture offering customized clothing for its um, consumers, but it was also providing a direct connection to the best fashions of Europe, particularly Paris. And what you see here is an advertisement for a Elsa Scaparelli gown uh, from 1938 in Madonna blue linen. And Bonwitz, with Fira Benenson directing the Salon de Couture and also serving primarily in, in a role as half buyer, half designer, was able to negotiate exclusivity with all of the houses that were represented in the Salon de Couture. And this is an example of that from Harper's Bazaar. Odlum was not just interested in meeting the needs of her wealthiest customers. Personally, she understood the needs of a woman on a budget. When she and Floyd first moved to New York, they were invited to a Thanksgiving dinner at the home of a wealthy colleague. Floyd had no dark shoes, so he painted a light pair with shoe polish. This was met with complaints of the smell of fumes during dinner. <laughs> Hortense wore an ill-fitting dress that didn't suit her because it was the only thing she could find on her limited budget. According to Odlum, quote, because I had been one of them, I knew that there were countless women with modest budgets who knew and wanted to wear good clothes. Good in the sense of design and fabric as well as practicality. Their numbers had been, been increased by the first years of the Depression. There was an enormous market waiting for any merchant who would take the time and trouble to find out what its needs and preferences and financial limits were." End quote. Odlum observed that the moderate dresses offered at Bonwitz were covered in decoration in order to compensate for the fact that they were per poorly made or designed. She stated, quote, there isn't a dress in that department that a well-dressed woman would want to wear. I've never seen so many Christmas tree ornaments on clothes. Our moderate price merchandise must be the best we could find in the markets, end quote. It was Odlum's assertion that women would respond to dresses that were of better fabrication with clean line and minimal ornamentation that would allow the wearer to be stylish yet practical, offering length of and versatility in wear. She worked and pleaded with her buyers and manufacturers, most of whom were men, to deliver this kind of merchandise. Despite their protests, she insisted, and finally a product arrived in spring 1934 and was presented in newly branded departments called Rendezvous and Debutante. Both departments were for a younger yet moderate priced customer. Joan Klein of the Jewish Bulletin, who penned a regular column on shopping and fashion, wrote in 1934, quote, one of the bright spots on Bonwit Teller Fifth Avenue is the exciting young rendezvous fashion shop on the second floor, all in down-to-earth pricing and designed to make the most of your good points, end quote. What you see here are three different ads, both from Rendezvous and Debutante. The first one on the left is Rendezvous, rendezvous this confetti tweeds. Um, oftentimes in these advertisements, you'll see this idea, particularly during the Depression, of multiple pieces for a single price that would increase versatility in the wardrobe. The debutante department was slightly more upscale than rendezvous, rendezvous, and you see that advertised in the coat that's in the middle of the screen from an ad that was in vogue, and then another example on the far right-hand side. This is also an ad that is for uh, this newly branded shop. And one of the things that I wanted to point out here was that Bonwitz, along with others in the period, were trying to promote versatility and style in multiple pieces, but were also taking advantage of manufactured fibers. Here we see an example of rayon, which was more affordable and easy to care for, and yet you still got a lot of bang for your buck and a whole lot of style. This is actually an ad from September 1937 in Vogue. 
Aside from improved assortment, a more attractive store, more engaged salespeople, and a customer-centric attitude, Odlum also recognized the need for the addition of services. In October of 1934, one of the first additions made soon after her appointment to president was that of a beauty salon. Other stores, again, such as Saks Fifth Avenue, already had salons. However, Odlum recognized that this service was distinctly lacking in a store that only sold products to women. She stated, quote, I wanted to have eventually under our roof every convenience for women who were shopping. A beauty salon was certainly one of them. I knew how weary a woman can get who's been shopping all day and how thankfully she relaxes under the ministrations of a skillful hairdresser, end quote. The salon was under the direction of Monsieur Lyon and featured a plush interior with individual booths for clients, specially designed wall murals, murals, and yellow draperies and furniture. Agnes Fairman again decorated the new space, and Monsieur Lyon held a reception for the press on opening day with models quaffed in his creations. This edition was long lived. From October of 34 onward, the store was never again without a beauty salon. Odlum also realized that there was an opportunity to increase sales during the holiday shopping season. Women who were most often busy shopping for others during the holidays were also the recipients of gifts. In order to appeal to men shopping for women, the 721 Club originated in 1934, her first year as president. Odlum explained, quote, Another way we've tried to lighten the masculine gift burden is to have all through the Christmas season a department which is for the exclusive use of our men customers. We call it the 721 Club, our street number on Fifth Avenue, and we've tried to make the atmosphere there as much like a man's club as we could so that they'd feel more at home than they usually do in a woman's shop. They can settle back in comfortable chairs and sip refreshing drinks while they look at gift suggestions, end quote. The club was well received. What started out during Odlum's first holiday season as president in 1934 with 100 members grew to over 500 members by 1937. In order to shop at the 721 Club, you had to be a credit account holder or the husband of an account holder. Each season, Bonwitz would also hold a preview for women to get a glimpse of the new gift assortment. Women shoppers were able to leave behind a wish list that itemized their current sizes to make shopping for the men in their lives even easier. The club was staffed with attractive women in green dresses and maintained an air of exclusivity via a private entrance, red lacquered doors, and a sign above the entrance that read 721 Club for Men Only. Bonwitz was the pioneer of the specialized Christmas shop for men. In 1952, Saks Fifth Avenue opened the male-only Stag Club, borrowing its name from the Bonwitz annual opening party for the 721 Club. In 1954, cosmetics firm Elizabeth Arden also opened a male-only private shop called 1 East 54th Street, which was named for the store's address, copying the Bonwitz naming strategy. Other retailers offered male-only shopping services in the form of specialized salespeople, such as Lord & Taylor's Red Rose Shoppers and Bergdorf Goodman's Christmas Angels, but without a private club-like atmosphere where coffee and pastries were served in the morning and hors d'oeuvres and cocktails in the afternoon. Upon the closing of the 721 Club in 1971, after receiving quite a bit of heated pressure from the Human Rights Commission, a long-term patron lamented that it was, quote, the only place you can get a decent drink on Fifth Avenue, end quote. <laughs> Odlum's hiring decisions, merchandising strategies, and personal transition from housewife and mother to business leader and champion of women in business evidenced a feminist approach. The New York Times report reported that she was, quote, assembling a staff of executives almost entirely feminine, end quote. To develop a holistic feminine point of view in her business, Odlum turned to the most important female voice, that of the customer. She did this first through the creation of an open door policy that made her personally accessible to any customer who wanted to lodge a complaint. By 1935, Odlum created the Consumer Advisory Committee. Ira Neemark described the committee as, quote, Hortense Odlum's crowning achievement. Her leadership of the committee brought great public relations to the store and made a profound impression on her customers. To be on the committee was an honor and a privilege, end quote. 
Mr. Niemark, who is now in his 90s and communicates with me via email all the time, began his career in 1938 as a doorman at Bonwit Teller, actually, for the 721 Club. Niemark shared his recollections of Odlum's tenure as president of the store for this research, and you may recall that Niemark would go on to be the famed CEO of Bergdorf Goodman. The Consumer Advisory Committee provided Odlum and her team with valuable insight. The committee met on a monthly basis as Odlum would host a lunch in her office with a variety of both charge and cash customers who, according to Neemark, received a gift for their participation. And a New York Times advertisement from 1938 featured a summary of the committee's work and an illustration of Odlum at lunch with her customers. As an offshoot of the customer luncheons, Bonwitz also held customer conferences for larger audiences that provided workshops for women on dressing and fashion trends. One such conference that was held at the St. Regis Hotel was so popular that over 1,200 women were turned away. Not only did Hortense hire Fira Benenson, who did a fabulous job for her in the Salon de Couture, but she hired another woman, Sarah Penoyer, to be her director of promotion, and who also would eventually go on to be the director of visual merchandising at Bonwitz. Um, we're all familiar with Jean Moore having been a visual director at Bonwitz, but before Jean Moore, there was Sarah Penoyer. Sarah Penoyer was the architect of one of the most successful taglines that was utilized in Bonwit Teller advertisements at this time from the 1930s into the 1940s, which was the smart woman's angle. I love that. It's not the pretty woman, it's the smart woman. In addition to that, Sarah would actually write a series of books uh, called Polly Tucker Merchant. And this series of books about Polly Tucker, this fictional character, was about a young woman who moved to New York and found for herself a career in the fashion business and ascended the corporate ladder. A line of branded apparel and accessories, also called the Polly Tucker line, was developed and sold in the store. And the proceeds from the sale of the book actually went to the Bonwit Teller Employee Scholarship Fund, of which Ira Mark was a recipient, where that allowed him to complete his degree at Columbia. By January of 1940, Bonwitz achieved annual sales of over $10 million, a 190% increase in volume since the beginning of Odlum's presidency in 1934. On the anniversary of her sixth year as president, the store achieved this financial milestone, which was a record for the company not seen since the early days of the 1920s. Having achieved what she set out to do, Odlum stepped down as president at the end of 1940. William Holmes, who she hired as the store's general manager and vice president, was promoted to fill the open position and stated, quote, there will be no change whatsoever in our policy, and we will carry on all the principles Mrs. Odlum has laid down for us, end quote. Odlum then actually became chairwoman of the board and served in this capacity until 1944, when she permanently retired. According to Ira Niemark, quote, the great, the general public perception of Bonwit Teller during the late 1930s was the best high fashion retailer on Fifth Avenue. It was no doubt due to Hortense Odlum's vision, end quote. I'm sharing with you here an advertisement that was shown um, on the occasion of her sixth year of president with Hortense actually holding a cake in her hand in the shape of the store. And once she stepped down from president, she actually did write an autobiography called A Woman's Place that you see pictured on the right-hand side. Okay, so we're time porting forward now to the 1960s to talk about another female leader of Bonwit Teller, Mildred Custon who, by the way, is drawn here by the um, famous fashion illustrator Kenneth Paul Black, uh, whose collection of illustrations is in the Museum of Fine Art in Boston. Mildred Custon served as Bonwit Teller's president from 1965 to 70. Mildred Custon was born on the 25th of January, 1906, and spent her early life in Boston, where she attended and graduated from Simmons College. Early rejection of her application to the R.H. Macy and Company Executive Training Program didn't deter her, and she instead took a clerical position with the retailer in 1928. She worked for several other retailers in Boston before accepting a position in 1935 with John Wanamaker of Philadelphia. Here she fine-tuned her skills as a merchant, initially working as a gift buyer, and then as the chief buyer for a moderate women's specialty fashion department called the Tree Booth Shop. 
It was in the tree booth shop that Custon first bought apparel starting in 1945 and learned how to diversify her assortment with color and sizing. According to Custon, quote, I never had less than 36 of a style, no matter what the price. When that shop opened, it was successful from day one because we had every size and every color, end quote. Her success with the tree booth shop led to her promotion as first merchandise manager of Ready to Wear in 1947, and then in 1951, vice president of the Wanamaker's organization. When Custon was approached to become the regional president of Bonwit Teller's three stores in Philadelphia in 1958 at the age of 52, she had already spent 30 years working in the retail industry. By 1965, Custon's effort had raised sales at the Philadelphia division of Bonwit Teller by 26% through the creation of eye-catching windows and the design of luxurious store interiors. In fact, she was seen as such a success that the Philadelphia Merchant Association named her Man of the Year in 1963. <laughs> Time Magazine reported on her being referred to as a man as, quote, one of the crosses successful women must bear, end quote. To be successful at work, Custon explained, quote, there isn't room for a husband and children in the kind of job I have. Retailing is a full-time job, end quote. Time further described Custon as belonging to a special group of female executives in retail, such as President Dorothy Shaver at Lord & Taylor and President Geraldine Stutz at Henry Bendel, who, if, quote, content to wear a costume ring instead of a wedding band, can rise to rule the executive suite, end quote. Uh, Custon is pictured here on the left with her very good friend um, and fellow maven, Estee Lauder, on the right-hand side. Custon served as regional president in Philadelphia for Bonwitz until 65 when she was offered a promotion to president of the company out of the New York flagship store at 56 and 5th Avenue. She accepted the position at a salary of $60,000 a year, which I was curious, so accounting for inflation would be $448,000 today. In this new role of expanded responsibility, Custon led a multi-million dollar fashion retailer, which like other stores of the era, needed a fresh approach to navigate the turbulent social climate of the 60s. Custon proved to be just the woman for this job. While living and working in Philadelphia prior to coming to New York, Custon was also very involved in the Fashion Group International, and in 1963 served as co-chairman of the Crystal Ball, the annual event held at the Philadelphia Museum of Art to support the institution costume and textile collection, sponsored by the fashion group. You see Custon here pictured with two of that year's honorees, including opera star Marian Anderson and Philadelphia native on the left, and fashion designer Gustav Tassel standing to her immediate right, who also for this occasion had designed a special couture gown for Custon that's held in the collection at the Phil Philadelphia Museum of Art. I had the opportunity to do a first-hand analysis of this garment this past summer, and what struck me the most is the incredible embroidery that you see in the detail here, all executed by hand. And it was clearly a couture garment because one of her arm openings was significantly smaller than the other, um, and it, it has held up beautifully. One thing that I thought was interesting is that the image that's on the website was leading me to believe that I was going to see this white gown with gold embroidery. It's actually a very beautiful dove gray. Vogue magazine dominated the delivery of fashion editorial in the 60s under the watchful eye of Diana Vreeland for most of the decade. Vreeland celebrated the unique and believed the 60s was a time of revolutionary style as different became, in her opinion, for the first time, beautiful. In one memo dated the 1st of February, 65, she wrote, quote, how boring to copy the past with all the magnificence of today and tomorrow, end quote. It was Vreeland that first embraced the influence of celebrity culture at Vogue. Her 1966 cover that featured the uncommon beauty of Barbara Streisand with her exaggerated makeup and substantial nose contributed to a new understanding of what beautiful was or even could be. Vreeland embraced the new, different, and somewhat obscure and used the pages of Vogue to communicate her unique point of view throughout the 60s. Vreeland's vogue allowed the outsider to shine. Her exotic demeanor and embrace of the avant-garde eventually led to her abrupt dismissal, but vogue undoubtedly became a powerhouse under her leadership and a beacon of style and fashion for the 60s and beyond. 
It was in this climate of cultural diversity, mass consumption, and shifting beauty ideals that Custon took the reins of Bonwit Teller. Like Hortense Odlum before her in the 30s, Custon immediately set about renovating stores, which created appropriate spaces to highlight new and modified product offerings. However, Bonwit Teller of the 60s was strikingly different than when Odlum started in 1934 with only a single store. By 1965, Bonwitz was a 12-store chain with locations in New York, Manhasset, Long Island, Island, White Plains, Short Hills, Philadelphia, Oak Brook, Palm Beach, and Boston. Custon was apparently not intimidated and set her vision in motion immediately. The first six months of her tenure was the most financially successful in the entire history of the company. Custon was 59 years old when she arrived in New York to take on the role of running all of Bonwitz. Yet her sensibility was far from that of the establishment, which, if defined by age alone, the youth of the 1960s would have associated her with. Custon had an appreciation for the melding of both high and low brow popular culture, even in her own style choices. One reporter noted Custon's outfit during an interview, and the choice personified this melding, quote, a brown jersey cardan dress splattered at the hem with white plastic circles and a Mickey Mouse watch encircled her left wrist, end quote. Perhaps it was this ability to meld diverse styles and cultural references that made it possible to introduce a new fashion category for an entirely different gender of customer to Bonwit Teller. Her mix of high-end dress with a watch linked to American popular culture personified Custon's dis distaste for what author Levine has described as class-bound definitions of culture. Masculinity had been strictly defined in dress in the United States for over a century. In introducing male customers to a store dominated by women's goods, Custon supported new ideas of what it meant to be a man of the era. One designer who capitalized on a loosening of social norms in dress for men was Pierre Cardin. Cardin was a new breed of designer who, similar to his peers Yves Saint Laurent and André Correge, embraced style and attitudes that developed from youth culture in the street. One of the original bad boys of fashion, the Chambre Syndicale de la Haute Couture actually withdrew Cardin's membership as a result of him showing a ready-to-wear collection in 1959. Cardin marketed the collarless Nehru jacket, which was seen as revolutionary due to its abandonment of traditional tailoring and classic bespoke silhouette that had been in place since the 19th century. Cardin created suiting for men with silhouettes that were reminiscent of the Edwardian period. Many men adopted these new styles, proving, according to Nora Ephron, quote, that dandyism and homosexuality did not necessarily occur simultaneously in nature, end quote. The male of the mid-1960s enthusiastically flung open Pandora's box with newfound enthusiasm for expression. You see here examples, an advertisement from Vogue on the left-hand side of the screen announcing the addition of the men's shop to Bonwit Teller, which was started with specifically a Pierre Cardin boutique. And shortly thereafter, the Pierre Cardin boutique for women was added to the store. So it was Custon who actually introduced Pierre Cardin to the American market. Custon started work on the creation of the men's department at Bonwit Teller as soon as she took control of the chain in the beginning of 1965. Renovation and planning took slightly over a year, and by the autumn of 66, Bonwitz had not only introduced menswear to the assortment, but had done so with the launch of Pierre Cardin to the American market. According to Custon, quote, the men's shop was quite an innovation at the time because it was the beginning of the Peacock Revolution. Clothing for men had been very con a very conservative sort of business with little or no change in fashion or style for years, end quote. Bonwit's introduction of clothing for men to a physical environment that was synonymous with femininity was a gamble in itself. Other stores that had already carried menswear, such as Brooks Brothers and Saks Fifth Avenue, hesitated to adopt European menswear styles, styles, which were more daring in color, fabrication, and silhouette than American options. In Western Europe, men had adopted these fashion-forward clothing options as early as 1960. Indeed, Cardin showed his first menswear collection in Paris in 1960, yet the American market remained unreceptive. However, Custon thought otherwise, stating, quote, we thought this could be a very exciting thing for Bonwitz. It was a huge success from day one, end quote. The first manager of the men's department at Bonwitz was Jack Daniel Zaram, who is pictured there in the boutique on the right-hand side of the screen. 
He was also a customer of the new Pierre Cardin boutique, evidenced here by his cotton brown velvet suit purchased from Bonwitz in 1967 and held in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The timing for the opening of the Pierre Cardin boutique for men at Bonwit Teller on the 6th of October 1966 was ideal. The occasion was celebrated with an in-store cocktail party and fashion show the evening prior, attended by over 400 guests. The wife of Hervé Alfond, then French ambassador to the United States and also pictured here on the right, commented on the new silhouettes, quote, all the clothing is so close to the body without being tight. It makes men look longer and thinner, and the fatter they are, the thinner they look, end quote. According to the New York Times, the new Cardin boutique for men at Bonwit Teller introduced the French couturier's neo-Edwardian silhouette for men, the double-breasted blazer and other notions that deemed radical or effeminate. The in-store boutique was modeled after Cardin's Paris flagship store, Tu Parlome, that had three floors and was the largest menswear store in Paris at the time. Customers immediately responded favorably. Vogue reported that one shopper left, quote, Bonwitz Cardin shop after ordering jackets, trousers, raincoats, sweaters, shirts, ties, and the hat to be shipped to him in Virginia. On second thought, he couldn't wait. He wore the hat and walked out with it on his head, end quote. Bonwitz became the fashionable American destination for peacocks as Custon had also negotiated exclusivity with all the vendors represented in the men's department. Cardin was initially exclusive to Bonwitz in the United States and the store added a women's boutique shortly thereafter. Bill Blass, who was initially also only a women's wear designer, expanded his business to fashion for men as well. His first collection of menswear in 1967 featured items such as reversible collarless jackets in bright colors, a lack of formal neckwear, and knickers. At the time, he predicted that ties would eventually disappear altogether. These are examples of menswear from the 1967 Bill Blass collection for Bonwit Teller. The exaggerated plaid suit on the left includes trim ankle length trousers, while the double breasted jacket on the right is executed in shocking red. New approaches to silhouette, print, and color help define style components of the peacock revolution. Color and variety and fabrication abounded, including in Bill Blass's first collection for Bonwitz, quote, a red corduroy blazer worn with black and white checked wool slacks, a red Nehru blazer sweater worn with hot pink corduroy slacks, end quote. Like Cardan, Blass's menswear was originally exclusive to Bonwitz, and Custon's focus on a male customer proved long-lasting, as the men's department at Bonwitz expanded to every store in the chain and was in operation until the company went out of business in 1990. In fact, on that last shopping trip that I made with my mother, I bought a French, she bought me, a French Terry Kermit green and white oversized sweatshirt that I wore with the collar popped up and the sleeves rolled up that I just had until a few years ago. Custon's embrace of new styles was not limited to the men's department. She established partnerships with both European and American designers who brought innovative and exclusive looks to the store. As she had done with Pierre Cardin, Custon looked to another European style maker, André Correge. This time is an opportunity to further expand her female customer base. She sought out exclusivity of representation, and in 1966, one third of Bonwit's imports for women were exclusive to the retailer. The Parisian-based André Correge exploded on the fashion scene in 65 when he introduced a space travel-inspired look epitomized by short white boots, shiny plastic fabrications, boxy silhouettes, and short skirts, pictured on the left. The Americans and Russians were locked in a heated race to the moon that culminated with Neil Armstrong's lunar landing on the 20th of July 1969, and fashion and popular culture of the era reflected this fascination with space travel. Despite his initial success in 65, Karej was not prepared to deal with the massive response to his space travel-inspired fashions, and his product manufacturing was troubled. The designer did not complete another major collection until 1968, when Correge's partnership began with Bonwit Teller. Despite his early setbacks, Custon recognized that the, that the designer still had the ability to be at the forefront of fashion innovation, and on the 6th of February, 1968, the André Correge Couture Future Boutique opened on the fourth floor of Bonwit's in New York City. The uh, acid orange pantsuit pictured on the right-hand side of the screen is from that initial collection and is held in the museum at FIT. 
This new collection of couture future from Andre Correge was much softer now with a rounded look and lots of scallops on hems or necklines and even an occasional Peter Pan collar. This less severe mod style of Correge is evident in a dress from his Bonwit Teller collection that was actually worn by Custon, then age 62. And Correge commented, quote, when I wanted to impose style, I had to be very brutal about it. Now I have changed. I can be Correge shouting as well as smiling, end quote. Custon not only sought out established European designers, but also supported new American designers. Calvin Klein's career began with a visit to Mildred Custon's office in 1968. Klein had completed a collection of samples and arranged a meeting with Custon through one of the buyers at Bonwitz. She was impressed with the collection. However, she knew that Klein would be unable to maintain the quality he was showing at the wholesale price he was asking. Custon told him, quote, now young man, if you want to come back here a year from now, you will have to increase the price of each of these garments at least by $10, end quote. Klein received his first major order under Custon's tutelage for $100,000 at retail. His youthful silhouette and clean American take on design was perfect for the Miss Bonwit shop that Custon had created to attract a younger clientele. Under her guidance, the store advertised Klein's collection. You see an advertisement of such there on the left and also featured the clothes in all eight of Bonwit's windows, effectively launching the ascension of one of America's most famous designers of the 20th century. One thing I think that is interesting to note about the relationship between Custon and Calvin Klein, and I've read many sources and many books about Calvin Klein, and there's even a YouTube video where he gives a long speech about the beginning of his career, and he talks about going to this woman's office who, give, who gave him advice. He never mentions her name. Mildred herself was also a style icon. For Custon, the ability to recognize a new trend or potential product offering was not limited to apparel. As hemlines went higher throughout the 60s, Custon asked of her friend and cosmetics innovator Estee Lauder, quote, what are we doing about those legs, end quote. This led to the creation of a line of skin care and beauty applications specifically for legs and carried exclusively at Bonwit Teller. Like Hortense Odlum before her, Custon believed direct contact with her customers showed them that she understood their needs and interests. This personal communication with her predominantly female customer was, in Custon's opinion, important as, quote, after all, women buy about 70% of menswear and most of the home furnishings, too, end quote. These are all examples of surviving material culture that were actually owned by Custon and were initially part of the collection at the Brooklyn Museum and are now in the collection at the Met. One of her favorites was Galanos. Both of the gowns, the first one on the left and the one in the middle, are Galanos. The first one from 1969, the middle from 1974, and the last white draped gown is Stravopolis from 1972. Custon, likely taking a cue from Stutz at Bendel's in her street of shops, also created a branded in-store boutique for women called the Safari Room. Yes, it's S apostrophe Fari. <laughs> where she featured exotic looks and new designers from around the globe. Custon stated, quote, we did the safari room. We were the first ones to give unknown designers a show place for their lines. That's where Giorgio de Sant'Angelo first came on the scene in the safari room, end quote. According to Sharon Zukin, quote, Bonwit's safari room featured a smaller changing assortment where women could hunt for the big game of new fashion, end quote. Although there was a focus on offering new and varied designers in the department, it was the concept and marketing of the space that women's wear daily referred to as, quote, the total sell, end quote. The branded shop was highly promoted, and as can be seen here, a March 1969 cover of Vogue featured brightly colored beads by Giorgio de Sant'Angelo that were available exclusively at Bonwit Safari Room. Custon reluctantly left Bonwitz in 1970 as the company had a mandatory retirement age of, of 65. However, her career was far from over, and she went on to establish Mildred Custon Limited, a retailing and fashion consultant firm. In this new business, she was part of the development team that created vertical malls in the United States, including Water Tower Place in Chicago and the Renaissance Center in Detroit. Vertical malls, particularly Water Tower Place in Chicago, contributed to the revitalization of downtowns and attracted shoppers, tourists, and new urban residents following the deurbanization trends of the 1960s. 
Custon operated her firm until 1991, and she passed away in 1997 at the age of 91. So for those of us that remember Bonwitz here in the city, we know that it was on the location that is now uh, Trump Tower. And I wanted to share this image. There were these beautiful Beaux Arts limestone bas reliefs that were on the front of the building that were quite controversial. Uh, they had been promised to the sculpture collection at the Metropolitan, but at the last moment, D Donald decided that they were just too huge, and so they were jackhammered um, and unfortunately thrown into the trash. But Bonwitz did close in 1990. Um, as the store was raised to make room for Trump Tower, and shortly thereafter, the rest of the stores in the chain were liquidated as well. Finally, there was, a third, there was yet a third female president of Bonwit Teller, Helen Galland, who's pictured on the right-hand side of the screen here. She actually oversaw the transition from the flagship location to the much smaller space attached to Trump Tower. So when they put up Trump Tower, they moved the store around the corner, and immediately they lost $25 million in business, and shortly thereafter, the store went out of business. The questions become to me then, why are we here? What's the point? For me, it seems clear. There are assuredly countless untold stories of the contributions of women to retail. Shopping itself helped to shape the distinctively American culture of consumption and was most certainly in and of itself a practice that was gendered in the feminine. Retail or fashion in general became an avenue for the career-minded woman to achieve a modicum of success despite their gender and despite limited opportunities in other business sectors, and yet their stories and obvious impact on our total fashion industry remain relatively unknown. For me, though, it wasn't just about the women as a marginalized group that found their way into a possible career in retail. It was also the same for gay men. Retail was a haven for the woman or the gay man to put their skills to use to achieve a positive outcome. An early version of this research that I submitted for publication to a journal that will remain unnamed <laughs> came back with feedback on Hortense Oblum asking me why should we care about Hortense. Her husband owned the business. He gave it to her. And in my mind, that person completely missed the point. Haven't we ever heard of the Kennedys or the Bushes? I think all of these contributions that women were able to achieve, despite the way that they got there, are worth remembering. I'm so grateful to have had this opportunity to share with you some of them today. Thank you. when uh, they were feminizing the managerial staff and, and that. How tough were the women managers? Because my mother, she's 100 now, she was working at uh, Bergdorf in the 50s, and she had uh, female uh, bosses. Boy, they busted your chops. You know, men, you know, I'm just thinking, men can sometimes you know, behave gentlemanly towards the ladies, maybe not, but uh, I just wonder if there was any stories around uh, yeah, actually, it's a great question, and there are accounts in both respects for Hortense Odlum and also for Mildred Custon. Mildred Custon, in particular, was noted in multiple sources that I encountered as being a very kind of soft-spoken, friendly woman that people saw as being somewhat motherly. However, one of her employees um, was directly quoted as saying, of course, she's as helpless as a cobra. So I think, I think that women had to definitely find a way to be tough because they had to fight even harder in order to achieve the successes that you know men can be bossy and are called in control and women are bossy and are called a bitch. So uh, I think that it's definitely a true account. On that same note too, while the microphone is going over there, um, Hortense had this um, sort of dual personality. She was tough as well, but she used to bake cookies herself and bring them to the store and hand them out with little notes attached to them every time she saw somebody that did something really well. And she was a very kind of down-to-earth, very approachable woman. Ira Mark remembered he used to go get her lunch every day that she always ate the same thing. Plain white bread with ham and cheese, no mayonnaise, and an apple on the side. <laughs> This isn't, this isn't exactly about the women. Um, I'm not joking. It's not exactly about the women, but do you know when the association of Bonwits with purple started? Oh, 
I do. Um, the lavender that we all associate with Bonwit Teller was actually developed during Mildred Custon's time. I don't think that she was directly responsible for the lavender choice, but she certainly approved it. Yeah, and I chose that color for the slides and started with the advertisement because it, it was the brand color for Bonwitz. Thank you. Thank you.